Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our our webinar, or as we said today, may the 23rd be with you. I might have got that wrong, but uh, the intent was there. Listen, welcome. And I, I first of all want to thank you for attending our webinar. The, we're putting on a webinar today with a with an esteemed colleague uh, and guest who I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, it's entitled, We Just Had a Breach, Now What? And uh, this is exactly, we've entitled the, the presentation of the webinar today on exactly the kind of response that we get from a client. A client will turn to us and said, Rich, we've had a breach, now what do we do? Which is always an amazing thing where we go back and say, you had you not thought that out? Anyway, we put together some, some content today that uh, addresses the legal considerations associated in your response to a breach. And uh, like I said, we're, we're very lucky to have Jonathan Armstrong joining us. Jonathan's uh, the, um, uh, the lead uh, uh, solicitor over at Cordery Legal Compliance. Jonathan is, uh, well, let's, Jonathan, push me over to the next slide, will you, while I introduce you? Yeah. Thanks. Jonathan is... Jonathan, I've known Jonathan for years, and those of you who are aware of Risk Crew, and uh, you're probably aware of Jonathan Armstrong. He's he's my personal and professional go-to guy in the event that we have a question, a legal consideration, whether it's GDPR or a breach in general, what are the legal requirements? Uh, 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 and we usually put Jonathan right in touch with our clients, or or you know Jonathan's nice enough to you know prevent, uh, present the references to us that we can help uh, give us steer. So anyway, we thought we'd put John, Jonathan front and center uh, and give him the the uh, the limelight today and ask him to help us all under address what are the next steps what are the you know we've had a breach you should have plans you should have procedures but what are some of the legal considerations uh, throughout the four phases of the process so we've asked jonathan to literally give us a, a an introduction uh to the to the requirements gdpr requirements an overview of well, just generally what's on the threat landscape in terms of breaches uh where the most biggest activity and some of the bigger issues are and then walk us through the four steps that are aligned to what we should be doing in in investigating assessing and and remediating remediating and mitigating a, uh, a potential breach that we might experience anyway uh, with that intro uh, i'm going to turn it over to jonathan who's going to hold our hands and walk us through what we what we should be considering from a legal perspective uh, when we're considering a breach jonathan welcome and and i want to thank you again for for sharing your expertise with us i've got my notes i've got my papers i'm ready to take notes what have you got for us today well thanks very much rich and uh, thanks so much for the for the invitation. Great to speak to you all. As Rich said, I'm going to talk about how to respond to a data breach. I'm going to talk through five steps of responding to a breach. Obviously, this is quite often fluid in an evolving breach situation. We'll talk a bit about that as well. There'll be the chance to ask questions. We'll take most of them after about 40 minutes, but Rich might uh, butt in if there's a question that... Um, that needs uh, answering urgently. So feel free to ask questions throughout and you can do that using the Zoom sort of chat function at the bottom, which I guess we've all become painfully familiar with over the last three years or so. So let's start with your legal obligations. What are the GDPR security obligations? And obviously I just mentioned in passing that these haven't changed yet since Brexit, the UK government is planning to change the law in this area, but I'd predict that this bit won't change much. It's been relatively stable since 1984 when the first Data Protection Act came in in the UK. So the main security obligation is that the controller and the processor shall implement appropriate technical and organisational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk. So a couple of terms there, data controller. So most organizations will be data controllers for things like their customer data, for employee data, but they might appoint a data processor. And that's one of the big issues with data breaches at the moment, that many organizations have outsourced stuff that used to be core business. That might be payroll, that might be travel, that might be uh, HR. And what we're increasingly seeing 
is breaches by large processors, which have increased the reporting obligation for organizations. So obviously the capita breach is in the news at the moment, which is affecting many in financial services, in local government. We've also handled a, a data breach this year on behalf of a client of a payroll processor, where one payroll processor having an incident has affected 900 organizations and some 850,000 employees in the UK. And so breaches like that can often have a ripple effect. And obviously the obligation is not only on you to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures, we call them TOMS for short, but also on your uh, processor. And if either of you uh, has a breach, then that's likely to lead to consequences for you, even if you have outsourced that particular activity. So what's the current state really? Well, um, I think data breaches are up. I think that's partly because, as I've said, the ripple effect of breaches like um, Capita. And they are there's also, I think, at least one gang specifically targeting ransomware attacks on these large outsourcing organizations. And I'm guessing that's because they believe that these organizations are more likely uh, to pay ransoms rather than have the hassle of talk it through, uh, talking it through with their customers. And we're also seeing that ransomware gangs are really attuned to GDPR. If you look at the emails, for example, following the Royal Mail breach, you can see that the ransomware gang even did a GDPR fine calculation and used this effectively as part of their ROI for paying a ransom. And we'll all have seen in the news over the last 24 hours that there are some large GDPR fines about 1.2 billion for Meta yesterday and GDPR fines in total stand at around about the 4 billion euros level. Rich, did you have a question? I did, sorry to interrupt. Um, That's all can, right. you, can you go back to the, the, the previous slide, Jonathan? Yeah. I, I, I would love to, while I've got you here, uh, for, for me, our customers, the word in this definition, in this sentence that everybody wrestles with is appropriate, appropriate technical and organizational measures. I, I, I'd love to get your view on, 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 uh, on the definition of the word appropriate. What, is a, what does appropriate mean? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, and it's one to which there's no hard and fast answer. Appropriate is nearly always judged in hindsight. So it's like a good curry. We don't exactly know what makes up a good curry, but we can spot when there's a bad one. And it's a bit like that with Tom's as well. That, that there's no sort of set rule. You can obviously follow things like Cyber Essentials Plus, like ISO uh, 27000 series, but there's no set rule as to what good looks like. Just regulators will look at hindsight and say what bad looks like. One of the things we do know though, is if you're alerted to gaps in your TOMS, let's say for example, you've had a, an audit of your processes and that's found gaps, then in some respects, regulators are tougher on you if there are gaps that you knew of and ought to have corrected. And we've got a, a number of cases that illustrate that. There's one against a, a law firm in the, in the UK, for example, who went for cyber essentials accreditation, failed and didn't fix the issues that were on their deficit. And regulators are really focused on things. I know you've spoken really eloquently in the past about CVEs, the fact that a lot of uh, breaches are caused by a relatively small number of uh, errors in software code. Regulators are pretty good at spotting the live date of an exploit. So if the exploit happens on the 12th of May, you don't patch it and you're attacked on the 14th of May, then regulators are more likely to come down hard on you because they'll say, appropriate TOMs probably mean that you've got to patch quickly against known exploits.
But appropriate, but appropriate also means it's a subjective then. Uh, the business determines what's appropriate for the business. And, and I've always understood that the key is documentation. We, you know, the assessment and the documentation, this is appropriate for us, whether we're selling flowers or selling, you know, crypto on the web, we've determined what and, and set and defined the word appropriate. For me, that's that's the key is the, it, that that's found in the ISMS is the definition of this is appropriate for us. And that you live, like you said, you live and die by that. If you're not, if you're not on top of that, if you're not auditing that, finding holes, or you're, you're aware of patches, missing things, that, that that you're not keeping up that level of appropriate. But most of our customers struggle with this word appropriate, and they say, well, what's appropriate for us may not be appropriate for our co- uh, clients. But and and you're absolutely right. Appropriate's always often defined after the incident, after the breach. Yeah. Somebody comes in and says that was that may have been your definition of appropriate, but that's not our you know the the market's definition for that or the the industry definition for that sensitivity of data that was uh, involved in the breach. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, I think in part. I think it's objective, not subjective. But I think that the if if you go through a process and reasonably assess risk, then quite often a regulator will give you credit, even if you've got the wrong answer. So it's a bit like, I don't know, long division at school, where as long as you can show your workings out, you yes. still get credit for getting the wrong answer. And that and that's why. Um, but But I think I think usually if you ever get to, you know, the heat of litigation, then you'll always get somebody who could suggest they could have ironed out the issues. And that's one of the problems that you get in a lot of um, uh, regulatory investigations or, or, or litigation that often, of course, let's say we're relying on uh, on a software provider to deal with those uh, exploits you'll usually always get another software provider that said it wouldn't have happened if you'd have installed my kit. Sure. So you have to have a sense, you know, you do need experts, you know, like like you to work out whether, uh, you know, plan A is better than plan B, but obviously it's evolving as well. So if new technology comes in, you should evaluate that to see if that'll do a better job than what you have already. And that doesn't have to be, you know reams and reams of paperwork like you say you have to document stuff but that could be as simple almost as a word document with a line down the middle what is the technology we looked at did we install it if not why not thanks for that jonathan i didn't mean to take you off piece that's all right (laughs) um so we were we were talking about ransomware. Obviously, a lot of that is state sponsored or at least state condoned, and we're seeing many of the very organised uh, players around at the moment. As I said, often looking at this multiplier effect by targeting the organisations that we outsource stuff to. We've got an issue with the distributed nature of gangs. I know last time. Richard and I talked about this, I likened it to a Tupperware party. So a lot of these gangs have a model where there's, if you like, a central production unit that will produce the the exploit, the ransomware, and then they'll use a distribution network that they don't necessarily own. That's people who are sort of almost working from home, like Tupperware parties used to, and selling goods, in this case, uh, ransomware, uh, and collecting the money and then maybe paying a percentage back to the to the central organization. We're also seeing cyber mercenaries as well, people who will hack into organizations for hire. And some industries, you know, F1 motorsports, for example, have had issues with cyber mercenaries for a long, long time, because obviously in some cases it's cheaper to steal than to develop. As I've said earlier, we're also seeing a real rise in GDPR fines. We're about 4 billion euros currently. And of that, I'd guess um, certainly more than half has been in the last 12 months or so. And that's a problem for many of us with our senior management team and with our boards, because they think that GDPR fines aren't happening when they are. And it often takes them by surprise when these things do happen. Now, let's not be alarmist about fines. The majority of fines aren't for security breaches, 
but I think it does still have an impact. I'll talk about auditors later, for example, and we need to uh, be proportionate in our response, but we also need to acknowledge the fact that the regulatory regime has changed. And for UK-based businesses that do business outside of the UK, obviously Brexit hasn't helped because if you have a data breach now, let's say you've got employees in Belgium and in the UK, you'll have obligations under EU GDPR and UK GDPR, and potentially you can be fined under both uh, regimes in parallel. We're also seeing people do stuff called cyber shorting. If you're a public entity where they are, instead of asking for a ransom as such, or in addition to a ransom, they're playing your shares because they know that public knowledge of a breach will affect the shares uh, downwards. Attacks are certainly worse with hybrid working. Attackers do know how people work. So, for example, we've seen a lot of attacks at the end of a working day when people are more tired. Uh, and that might be on a Friday when they know that the majority of people are working at home and don't have that support network. We're certainly seeing that people are clicking on more than they used to. And that's right at the top of the organization as well. I think part of that is that many people used to have, you know, what I call the clever Sandra next to them, where they'd see a link that looked a bit dodgy and they'd say to the person next to them, Sandra, could you have a look at this because it looks a bit dodgy? And Sandra would say, do not click on it. And then peace would reign. But what we're quite often seeing, again, with senior people rather than junior, in my experience, is people are thinking, what's the worst that could happen if I click on that link, particularly if they're at home, particularly if it's five o'clock on a Friday, and then bad things happen as a result. We're seeing what's technically called spear phishing, so attacks that are really designed to hit CEOs and senior management using things like LinkedIn to research in advance, and they don't all rely on email. So, for example, we've had a case where an individual was into air displays and aircraft, and he um, visited a compromised site to look at a photograph of a particular plane that they knew that he was keen on through researching public information about him. And obviously, you might think, well, that's a lot of lengths to go to. It won't happen to me. But these type of attacks are really pretty cheap, particularly if it's this distributed Tupperware type model where the people who are engineering the exploit aren't going to the expense of distribution. So uh, these attacks can be more prevalent as a result. And we're seeing almost like the Ocean's Eleven of gangs with gangs maybe in Africa that might specialize in background research and in uh, getting people to click. We might see gangs uh, originating, for example, out of Russia who are developing the exploit. And then uh, gangs who are moving the money around, some of those associated with other organized crime syndicates, you know, Medellin cartel, et cetera, et cetera. So um, watch out for these unholy alliances, which again mean that more organizations are vulnerable. And to stress, it's not just your vulnerability you need to worry about, but the vulnerability of those you outsource things to. We're obviously seeing a lot of uh, Office 365 compromises. We're seeing issues with less socializing, that lack of clever Sandra, if you like, and people being more lone wolves. And then uh, we've also seen, I think, to some extent, I'm hoping this has improved now, issues with reduced patching as people come out of the pandemic. There was a school of thought uh, among some IT teams that they only wanted patches to be applied when people were in the office. And if they're in the office less, then patching isn't as quick. We've also seen what I call liberal IT, where, for example, organizations that used to disable the USB ports have enabled them now because otherwise people couldn't print at home during the pandemic, etc. So some organizations are reviewing the relaxations that they had on their security stands during the pandemic, but others just haven't fixed that yet. And again, a lot of attackers know where uh, these exploits are likely to lie. So we've done a lot of these breaches, probably 
I would say probably 120, 140 since GDPR came in. And we tried to devise a methodology which would enable us to work out exactly what needs to be done in a breach. One of the tips that I'd really give you is you need a plan and you need to rehearse it. And that plan needs to be uh, pretty simple, particularly for the bulk of your employees. So when we go into hotel rooms, for example, we have a, a, a thing on the back of the door that tells us what to happen if we discover a fire, usually just get out and we have an evacuation route and we rehearse those plans. You need to do the same with a data breach. It needs to be really straightforward for most users, raise the alarm, and then you need to have a plan behind that, which you rehearse regularly. And um, plans need to be simple, and you need to assume that you will have no access to your IT systems. So there's not really that much point in having a detailed response plan that only sits on your intranet, because obviously if there's a ransomware attack, you haven't got your, your intranet. And we did a really large ransomware attack for a household name business uh, a year and a bit ago where almost everything was down. They didn't even have, that. they were trying to um, tell people about the breach literally by friendship groups. So they would say, well, I think X went to Y's wedding. So they might have, their mobile phone number. So let's ring X to get to Y because they didn't even have a central list in hard copy of people's uh, um, mobile numbers. So one of the tips I would give you, we have um, just a red folder, a bit like uh, for those of us who are of a certain age, Aim and Andrews used to have in This Is Your Life. And it has um, tabs with various aspects of the plan and some of the stuff that we might need to respond to a breach. So what are these four steps? Well, first, investigate. Secondly, assess. Third, remediate. Four, mitigate. And as I've said, these can be quite fluid. Sometimes you'll need to be remediating as well as investigating, particularly in things like ransomware, where you're trying to take systems down and, and, and check them before you get them up again. So, but with that caveat, let's look at these four steps. Um, firstly, you'll need to investigate the breach, obviously. And there's a need for speed here. In GDPR, you've generally got an obligation to tell a regulator if you've had a data breach within 72 hours. And for ransomware, a breach can include what's called an availability breach. So if, for example, you need data, but you can't get it because it is locked, you'll probably need to report that breach as well. So in the payroll breach that I talked about, uh, 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 employees couldn't access data. As a result, some of them couldn't make mortgage applications. And our time for reporting the breach to 72 hours uh, starts when we discover that that system is unavailable. Um, there's a particular issue again with vendors here. You need to make sure that your contract with your vendor makes them tell you as soon as possible. A lot of vendors are sitting on breaches. There is criticism, for example, of Capita that it told people late and didn't tell people much about what went on. So you'll need to act with speed and you'll also need anybody you rely on as a third party to as well. You'll need to think about privilege right from the start. Uh, data breach litigation is still rising. You can't retrofit privilege. So privilege is a way in which if you consult with Lawyers, certain documents can be withheld from people making subject access requests or litigation requests. So you'll need to think carefully about that. And with that in mind, you'll need to think of your best team. That might include external lawyers. It might well include HR in case there's an HR breach, PR in case you need to go out and speak. Uh, speak to people. It might include investor relations if you're a listed entity because of those issues about insider trading, cyber, cyber shorting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And look at whether you could survive without key members of those team, uh, those, that team being available. So we've had quite a lot of breaches where, for example, the CEO has been on a plane. And yes, some CEOs travel on planes that don't have 
Wi-Fi, or you just haven't been able to raise people, particularly with time zones. We find particularly that um, UK subsidiaries of US entities often have an issue raising executives in the US um, in our morning. And we've even had one incident over a US Thanksgiving weekend where we could hardly find anybody at all for the whole weekend. So think of who your best team is and uh, and make sure that you've got substitutes so that like Man City, if you've got a lot on or people are unavailable, you can bring people off the bench. It's absolutely key to rehearse those uh, breaches as well. And obviously we're doing with Richard Data Breach Academy in September, that's a really good way of doing that. We know that people who have done an exercise like a Data Breach Academy respond better in a real breach. And a lot of this is about muscle memory, and a lot of this is about teams getting used to working together. We've also done breaches where people on the response team haven't met and haven't rehearsed, and that can be really pretty challenging. We did one which thankfully was a rehearsal, not a not a live incident where one of the teams didn't seem to be doing um, much at all. And uh, they said that uh, in their culture, they relied on being introduced to each other before starting to work together. And I, I was pretty amazed at that. You know, you said, so you want me as external lawyer to introduce the two of you who work for the same organization that I don't work for before you'll start communicating. And they said, yeah, yes, please, if you would. Um, and it's great that we found that out in a rehearsal. That's obviously dysfunctional. And organizations have got to rehearse. Then you find where your weaknesses are and you can correct them. You can also use that to help with your best team. If you've got somebody in a role, let's say head of HR, who just panics in the face of adversity, then you might subtly want to change the deputy head of HR being on the response team for breaches. You'll need to use a proper process as well. We tend to recommend using capture forms. So you'll agree a form in advance of the minimum data set that you're going to need to make reports, to be able to react, et cetera. And you'll socialize that form so that different people like PR or investor relations are capturing data that they might need as well. Um, and that's worth doing in advance. You've got to encourage reports. You've got to say to people, even if you suspect there's a breach, tell us. Tell us soon. Tell us what you know. You don't have to tell us the perfect picture. And you don't have to wait for a solution. We've seen many organizations where you said, why didn't you report the incident? They said, I didn't know how to fix it. Well, they're two different things. You've got to identify the problem and then fix it. You can't think I won't report the problem until I've got a solution. Uh, and that's often the case with things like lost laptops, relatively trivial breaches, where people will try and allow themselves 24 hours rigging the rail company to see if the laptop gets found. Usually that's not the, not the best thing to do. Usually you wanna start your reporting process in advance. And don't wait until Friday comes. More than 50% of the breaches that we see are on a Friday afternoon. There's all sorts of theories as to why that might happen. But um, obviously, you've got less ability to meet the 72-hour deadline if, you're, if you get to know the breach on a Friday. It obviously involves Saturday work. It involves Sunday work. You know, I'll get out the tiny violin for the lawyers. But it also means that often, what you can report to regulator isn't as good as if it's during the working week because you simply can't get hold of people, particularly if you're relying on vendors, as I say, to give you information. And obviously, that's one of the real issues that there, uh, that you get at the moment. You might have a large breach like the 900 uh, uh, um, company breach that I talked about, where information is pretty sparse. So some organizations are thinking of changing their response team. Is there somebody on the team who's good at corporate intelligence? If the vendor isn't going to tell us what's going on, can we monitor social media? Can we monitor the press to try and find out what's going on to meet our regulatory obligations? And we've had a breach recently where the information we gave to the regulator was almost all sourced through 
um, social media, uh, chat amongst uh, other victims, et cetera, et cetera. So then you've got to assess what the likely consequences are going to be, step two. So who are you going to have to report to? If you're in financial services, you're probably going to have to report to financial services regulators and a data protection regulator. Obviously, if you have a footprint in the EU, you're going to have to follow the NIST directive. You have to follow that if you're in the UK as well. But the NIST directive is being extended in the EU. So you may have additional reporting ob obligations under the NIST rules. In addition to GDPR, you might have obligations to report to a professional body uh, or another regulator. So you'll need to work that out in advance if you can. Obviously, not all breaches are reportable uh, to everybody at the same time and the thresholds might change. You'll obviously also need to look at customer reaction. As a very general rule, if you handle customers and employees correctly, then they can be forgiving. But if you handle them badly, then they won't be. We often advise clients to try and prioritize different categories of people. So an employee where you've compromised or where the payroll processor, for example, has lost their passport details and their national insurance number and their bank account details. If you can, a, a phone call to them offering help, meaningful help and identity theft protect, protection is obviously much better than a random uh, notice on the uh, uh, intranet to say that there's been a breach and various people have been compromised. So look at splitting the class of, pe uh, of affected people, communicating with them in different ways. You'll need to think of how you engage with stakeholders as well. Obviously, major investors will worry about a data breach. They think that that impacts on share price or in the value of an entity. And if you're looking to do some sort of transaction, we've had a couple of clients where they've been trying to arrange loan facilities. And because of the covenants in the loans, they've had to talk about a security breach real time. So you'll need to look at things like that. Look at your insurance position. Look at how you might defend civil claims. Again, that might uh, influence your uh, the, the public statements that you make, both to the individuals affected and to the press. But you can't say nothing. And I think it's um, almost an old rule that people used to say, oh, my lawyer tells me to say nothing. Well, in this space, it's very, very rare that a good lawyer tells you to say nothing. Um, the, there's an old uh, saying from Winston Churchill, I think, with um, a, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth has got its pants on. We saw that in Wales last night, for example, that when there's an information vacuum, people fill it with stuff, and that's often ugly rumor. So you'll need to have a communication plan that it almost certainly involves telling people about the incident. And one of the things we tell people to do in the data breach academies is agree a standard press release. It might be reactive, you might not send it out, but oftentimes in organizations, it takes a long time to agree a press release because all sorts of people want input into it. It's far better to agree a standard press release in advance and change your default settings so that the business says, we are going to send this if we have a data breach, unless anybody objects with a reason. And that's a lot easier to pull off in the heat of a breach than to be sending a draft around multiple people for them to redline and consolidate their changes. You're also gonna to have to look at the role of non-executive directors if you have them on your board. In the last 12 months or so, 18 months, I've seen NEDs be much more involved in data breaches. I've had data breaches where the NEDs have assigned somebody from the NED community to be on the data breach team because they're looking after their responsibilities, they're looking after the company, they're obviously looking after share price as well. And equally, auditors have been much more engaged in the last 12 months. I think that's partly because of the high level of GDPR fines, you know, uh, Meta, for example, have made statements in their public accounts about yesterday's fine and about fines coming. So there's much more of a spirit of openness, I think, that uh, organizations, uh, the, the board, the auditors, 
they want to know about incidents so that they can decide whether uh, public statements will have to be made. Even if you're not a listed entity, if you're planning some sort of transaction or if you're a local authority, for example, there's much more expectation of transparency, I think, than there used to be even when GDPR came in. So step three is remediate. And I'm conscious that I'm going quickly. I'm going to speak for about another uh, seven minutes or so. So feel free to get those questions in. Next step is remediation. Obviously, you need to start right away. We find out, we find from our experience that if you are self-aware, work out what went wrong and start to fix it before you make a report, if you can do that, within those 72 hours, your regulatory outcome is significantly better. So you're going to want to look at those TOMs, those technical and organizational measures. As Rich said, determine what's appropriate, reassess what's appropriate in light of what just happened. And if you can fix things easily, fix them easily. We've had clients, for example, who've bought DLP software solutions to stop uh, uh, data leaving the organization or looked at new holistic software or done training. And I think that does count in, in when a regulator comes to assess the incident. The more you can show that you have learned, the less they need to investigate and tell you what you should know. Um, so make concessions to data protection authorities. Do things like quick reactive training. If it's a phishing attack, for example, we've had a couple of episodes now where we've done uh, new training. I think online training rarely works. A lot of the um, breaches that we've seen are people who've gone through multiple online training courses, but they've still clicked on links. So we might say to the regulator, we're going to have face-to-face -face training or training via Zoom. We're going to not allow those people back onto the system until they've been trained, and that's going to happen in the next 24 hours. And if you can make commitments like that, I think your regulatory outcome is going to be much better. You'll need to look at a program of victim outreach, as we've discussed. Never, ever, ever, repeat never, repeat never, say that the company is the victim. Um, we've seen people do that, I don't know, in Talk Talk, for example, that just loses sympathy. Your employees, if you compromise their data, they're the victims, not you. You might be a loser as well as the corporation, but don't try and out victim those people who are going to have to change their bank accounts, change their passports, et cetera, et cetera. Watch out for a rise in subject access requests. That uh, happens pretty quickly after a breach now. We've had a case, for example, where we had relatively few number of employees involved, yet within 24 hours, there was a dedicated website up and running from a firm of claims farmers saying that that was the portal for litigation against my company. And uh, class action lawyers work weekends. So unfortunately, you have to as well. So watch out for the rise in subject access requests using GDPR to get data about the incident. The ICO in its standard um, sign off letters after a breach is saying that it expects organizations to invest in SARS. And just because the volume increases, they shouldn't let the standard slip. So you might need to staff up not only for uh, connecting with people who might be affected and a call center, but also extra people to deal with uh, data subject rights under GDPR as well. You might want to look at new policies and procedures. Again, the sooner you can bite the bullet and say what we did before didn't work and we're going to fix it or we're going to improve it, uh, the better, because you can put that in your uh, reporting letters and regulators might look more kindly on you as a result. And then, as I've said, vendors are appearing more and more in data breaches. From a rough rule of thumb, I'd say 75 to 80 percent of the breaches that we've handled in 2023 have been caused by vendors. So you need to hold them to account, ask them how they're going to fix this, ask, ask them what steps they are putting in place to make sure that this never happens again and build that in your report to regulators as well. Then step four is mitigate. That's obviously the liaising with debt protection authorities. As I've said, most breaches will be reportable. There's relatively few where they uh, don't have to re be reported to a regulator. Effectively, you're going to have to show that there's no likelihood of harm. That's very difficult, particularly difficult within 72 hours. 
You may not have to tell individuals because there's a different threshold that applies under GDPR, but you're probably going to have to liaise with regulators. And there's a mixed bag there. Some are slow, some are quick. It obviously depends on the information that you can provide them with. With things like ransomware, you can expect for a serious incident, uh, a, 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 an additional set of questions within about 48 hours. So don't think that you can report and then forget about it. You're going to need to still compile information. The exceptions to them are some of the larger breaches of vendors like Capita, like the uh, um, uh, payroll one I talked about, where they're already engaging with NCSC. So there might be information passing between NCSC and data protection regulators. So they might not ask you as many questions because they're getting that from the source. With any incident, you'll have to debrief and learn what could you have done better. And again, you might want to rehearse again. So you might want to do you know, another data breach academy or something similar to make sure that you know, any faults you had before you've ironed out and that you're ready for the next breach. Because without being pessimistic, for most organizations, you know, it's a cliche to say they're when, not if, but oftentimes you'll see a repeat of the same breach, particularly if it's ransomware, because the ransomware community is sharing sort of sucker lists uh, amongst them. Whether or not you pay or not, you're more likely to be hit again. And we've particularly seen with some of the Office 365 breaches that once they're in, then you can um, sometimes expect repeat issues, particularly if you've not fixed the problem in the first place, whether that be MFA or whether that be some latent issue with the security settings. You have to log an incident. Uh, so whether or not you report it, you'll need to uh, log it in your data breach log. That's a requirement in GDPR. You'll need to think carefully about what you say. Again, privilege is an issue there. The standard letter that you'll get if there is litigation after a breach will usually ask for a copy of the data breach log and tell you what your responsibilities are under GDPR and ask for a copy of it. So be careful about what you write. It needs to be comprehensive, it needs to show that you took the right steps, but you'll need to consider your legal position with that. You'll need to think about sharing the pain, particularly if vendors are responsible or if they've exacerbated the issue by not uh, getting back to you in time. If you've got a proper contract in place with the vendor and they've caused the breach, that will normally entitle you to claim all of your costs back from them. They should be insured uh, for that. So you'll probably want to have discussions about their contribution towards all the pain that you have had. Um, a quick word on insurance. I think people historically have regarded insurance as picking up the tab for all of this. I think that's unlikely these days. We've seen that the Lloyd's rules changed in March uh, uh, relating to state-sponsored cyber attacks. Uh, and uh, I think that's changed the market slightly. I think it was difficult to obtain insurance for many of our clients. They have managed to get insured this year and the market's got a bit better, but premiums are still higher than they used to be. And many insurers will uh, insist that you put measures in place to reduce their risk. We've had a few breaches where people have promised their insurer that they've done, that they've taken steps to prevent a breach, but uh, they haven't. And so in one, for example, they ticked a box to say that they used MFA, which was true for their uh, email client, uh, but wasn't true for some of the other systems that were outsourced to vendors. And when one of those systems is compromised, but you've ticked the MFA box, obviously you can't expect your insurer to pick up the tab for that. And when is a breach over? Well, unfortunately, I think it isn't over till it's over. And you never really know when it's over, particularly because of this situation, as I've said, with um, the sharing of data. Um, we see that the majority of ransomware attacks also involve exfiltration. And in some respects, it's a two phase attack that phase one will be asking for a ransom to unlock your system. And then if you don't pay the ransom, then then they'll ask you again for uh, another ransom. Uh, to not 
disclose the data. Intelligence suggests that in some cases that might even be two separate gangs. So gang one has sold the data to gang two. And sometimes we're seeing that the exfiltrated data appears months after the original uh, attack. So you can, can't really drop your guard, but I think if you've taken those four steps, then it's likely that you'll have uh, a, a response ready for when the bad guys come again. So I know that's been a whistle-stop tour of sort of, you know, if you like, 24 hours of a breach and how you respond to it. And I know I've covered an awful lot of stuff in a short space of time. There's some resources there which will help you. And I think, Rich, you said that uh, the slides will be uh, circulated afterwards. And um, so if you've uh, registered for the live version of the webinar, then you'll get the slides with those resources. Yep. And, uh, and I think, Rich, we also wanted to mention the Breach Academy that I'd touched on, uh, which will be in September, where you and I are going to do real uh, breaches, anonymized to protect the stupid. Um, but we're going to look at a real timeline from real breaches with real emails disguised uh, from uh, people involved and, and see how people respond. A really good chance of testing your response and testing your team. It is. It's a hands-on workshop um, uh, that, that Jonathan has, uh, has designed. It, it is very pragmatic. It, it, it's, it gets into depth of all these issues that Jonathan's talked about and very pragmatic and walks through examples uh, from how to be interviewed in the press to writing press releases to communication plans and in depth. And it's fun. Uh, and what I really like about what Jonathan does is it's an all-day workshop of uh, and we simulate breaches and simulate a team's response to that. And there's surprises because there's surprises with every single breach so jonathan has built in kind of some surprises and you you don't see these things coming and which is the nature of a breach so it's it's kind of you know uh, on the front uh, in in the in the trenches uh, type approach to breaches to see how you respond and to help you with your muscle memory but uh, jonathan first of all thanks you're you know one of the reasons i i, I love to hear jonathan speak is he calls it a whistle stop tour but literally every single thing i take away i find jonathan's advice and assistance, very pragmatic plans, have them, keep them simple, assume no IT. I mean, that's, that's, that's very, very, I, I can't tell you how many clients that I've talked to who, you know, where's your incident response plan? Well, it was on our drive in our folder and we can't get access to it. Okay. So that, that simple thing about keeping a hard copy of all of your plans and procedures and making sure that you've got it because your systems go down, your systems go down, that, that, that kind of logic is, is missing in, in because of our reliance on, on, on our systems, but, you know, keeping about your best team, rehearse, 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 not just for, you know, to identify vulnerabilities in your processes and what you might be missing, but to, as Jonathan said, to make muscle memory of the exercise. So when it does happen, you're moving before you really understand, you know, just by, just because it's already in your DNA, have a process, have, you know, have the list, you've got to encourage report, reporting, you've got to develop a, a culture of, of reporting. Yeah, everybody, uh, then, you, you know, how many businesses don't even have a list of who they need to report a breach to, from their regulators to their auditors to the ICO, uh, and having that all done, to, and then understanding the impact on customers, stakeholders, and NEDs, which I thought, Jonathan, that's, you know, we don't think of that. Um, we don't think of them as stakeholders, and they have a legal responsibility to, to um, uh, to the company, the, the communication plans, how important this is when things go bad, that you have a hard copy communication plan uh, and y the, the pre-written press release. Um, because can you imagine how long it would take to get stakeholders to agree on a press release statement? But just to, if you go through a, um, and you're practicing your plan as part of that is having a all agreeing on, you know, 75% of the content, 80% of the content of a general press release, but saying things up front and how I, I love your, you know, um, uh, your advice about never say the company is the victim and, and, and how many times do we see that? And, and you're absolutely right, Jonathan. That's exactly what I think. Oh, poor little you. What about the 3 million records of your clients? Uh, you know, you think they're not having a bad day today. Um, I, I thought that's, that's just brilliant. Getting started now. Don't wait. Get, defining your Tom's defining what's appropriate, you know, to, to your, um, to your business. Uh, 
anticipate the rise in SARS. Gosh, that's so that's so obvious, but we don't we don't see that. We have a breach. We're not in, and we think our customers don't care, and they're not going to uh, they're not going to come in and ask us for a subject access request. Um, I also wrote down class action lawyers work weekends. I think that's <laughs> that, that should go on a T-shirt. That, that is just that is just just perfect. Um, uh, but keeping a log. The other thing, pragmatic, I thought is everybody. We should all have a log. But understanding that that log will be turned over to to some. That's the first thing that people ask for is show us your log. So what you, you know, what you write, the extent, the granularity of 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 your response, and and how you log the incident itself is 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 paramount. Uh, debrief and learn, share the pain. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's Jonathan. We had some questions, and we do have time for questions. So let me shut up. And and one of the we, we've got a lot of questions, and they all come down to what you said uh, is um, is share the pain with vendors and making vendors responsible. How would you recommend? What is the best way to do that to bring your vendors in in terms of uh, uh, both sharing the pain and the responsibility in the event of uh, uh, of a breach or an incident? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of tips. I mean, obviously, it starts pre-breach, so it starts with the contract. But I realize that a lot of people have legacy contracts, and 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 I I would say the majority of the breaches that I see, the response team hasn't ever seen the contract with that with that vendor. And I think people are getting better, and I think GDPR's helped with that. It's reminded people that they have to have skin in the game. Obviously, the fine for meta uh i think perversely will be good news for things like that because it'll make people look more at server location and data transfer because there's you know 1.2 billion reasons why, why you should after the after the meta case so hopefully it'll make people look more before the event at things like where's the data what's the commitment to cooperation after a data breach can, I'll, have you got a full indemnity if there is an issue? What are the reporting obligations on the vendor? Um, things like that. But as, but assuming that your contract's a bit a bit ropey, then you are going to have to do some of the legwork yourself, which, as I said, could be doing open source intelligence, could be working out what's happening, could be discreetly trying to ask uh, other people who might know answers. So quite often we have um, an and you know, because you're on it, Rich, uh, a sort of telephone tree of people will ring and say, have you heard anything about uh, about this breach? So you're trying to get as much intelligence as possible. We've often found as well that some vendors, like obviously if, if somebody has lost the data of 900 customers, then it is not going to have a meaningful one-on-one -on -one dialogue with all 800 or 900 and they operate almost like a ticketing system in a deli i think some of them where you know if you're the first to ask for cheese then you get cheese and it's the same in a data breach if you're the first person to say can you tell me the answers to these questions then you might get answers whereas number 227 in line won't get those answers because the team are underwater by then so that's why I think a process is good. If you know the questions that you're uh, th that you uh, are likely to need uh, answers to from a regulator, and you have a process form that tells you that minimum data set, you can be pretty quick at saying, "Okay, the vendors told us this. We need answers to questions seven, eight, nine, and ten. Only the vendor can give us." those answers and you can get those questions over to the vendor within 30 minutes and sometimes getting out of the blocks quickly with questions that are really direct and to the point means you get answers whereas asking that vendor even two or three hours later means that you get a wall of silence and and obviously we've seen what people are saying in the public domain about the reports that they're having to make to regulators uh, after the capita breach and they're complaining that they haven't got enough information but they've got an obligation to make a report the other thing to consider with these mass vendor breaches is in some respects the do we report don't we report question is easier and in some 
cases, it's more difficult. You know, if you look at some of the big breaches, like there was a breach that hit um, universities and charities, for example, a couple of years ago, then um, some client, uh, some organizations, including our clients, took the view that we ought to report. But some organizations took the view that they didn't need to report to the ICO. Then what seemed to be happening is uh, there were various lists of customers of that vendor in the public domain. And some people were going out to say, you know, I give to University A and University B. University A has reported the breach to me. It has told me it's made a, a report to the ICO. You use the same platform, University B. Why haven't you told me? And because I'm worried about my data, I'm going to tell the regulator that I think you should have reported. So, so your difficulty is if you've got a breach from one vendor that's got 900 organizations, if you don't report, you're gambling on the fact that none of those 900 are going to report. Otherwise, you're potentially opening yourself up to a second fine for reporting the breach late. So you've got to think of these things really carefully. You know, when we looked at this payroll breach, we knew that some of the other customers of this vendor were on the regulator's naughty step. They'd had breaches that were still being investigated. So we know that they're very, very likely to tell the regulator. And as a result, even if you think, yeah, on the information we have at the moment, there's no re uh, reporting obligation, Will it change? Probably. The, the, the safe solution is, is often to make a report. Here's, um, while I've got you on this topic, here's a really good question we got in. If a vendor's platform, i.e. software as a service, is directly involved in a breach, would you recommend the identification, and they're, sorry, and they're not participating in terms of their accountability, would you recommend their, the identification of that vendor in a press release? Yeah, I, th I think the press release is tricky. We uh, have definitely identified vendors like that to the regulator. And I think if you are not getting information that you need out of the vendor, then in most cases, if you're going to have to report to the regulator, be open and honest with the regulator and say, I'd like to be able to tell you more, Mr. Regulator, but I can't because our vendor won't tell me. I think press release is a, is is a is a brave move. I'm not I'm not saying it's something I'd never do, but I'd think pretty carefully about it. Um, I'd probably only do it when I'm in last chance saloon with the vendor. Some vendors are very uncommunicative in the first, you know, three, four, five days, but then get much better at it after a week or so. And so sometimes you've got to cut vendors a bit of slack to get better. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Jonathan, we're gonna to have to cut it there uh, for a time. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. That was, that was like I said, uh, was spot on. I really appreciate uh, all good advice. Um, and to our listeners, thank you very much for attending. Uh, listen, if you go to the chat uh, portion, you'll see a link uh, to Jonathan's the, the Data Breach Academy that uh, we're holding on the 20th of September. Uh, we'll also send you a follow-up email if, you're, if you subscribe to the actual webinar itself uh, with more information. But um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, uh, we do have a load of questions and we'll try to finish them and send them out in terms of a follow-up email with unanswered questions. Jonathan, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Once again, um, excellent advice. Thank you. Pleasure, thanks. Rich, and thank you. And thanks the risk crew team for setting all this up. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and uh, we'll see you soon. <laughs>